as I've been reading chapter by chapter, verse by verse through the book of Matthew, I've come across, at least in the chapter 11 and part of chapter 12, a direct reference by Jesus to wisdom. And talk about something we need for the day with all of the deception that's going on and everything going, that we can't answer these questions. Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 of the Olivet Discourse says, see to it that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name. If that's the first thing that he said about the signs of the end, that deception was gonna be everywhere, then we need to take heed because wisdom would be the way to combat that kind of deception. And I thought this was really important. And I came across this verse, and it's a verse that I chew on from time to time, and I understand it better every time I read it. And I want to talk about it today, as this Bible study is about wisdom. Jesus says in chapter 11, uh, verse 19, at the end of this verse, he says, Wisdom is justified by her children. What does that mean? Wisdom is justified by her children. Well, as we go through this, I'll show you and illustrate what that means. But simply put, it means that someone who hears and understands, well, you, you know that he understands by the way that he interprets what it is that's going on, by what he brings, by the fruit he bears, by how he lives his life, by understanding the signs of the times. You would be able to know by the offspring of that wisdom whether that's the wisdom you should be following. It it kind of seems like when one lemming jumps off to its death over the cliff and all the lemmings follow it, that there is a lack of wisdom. And that lack of wisdom shows in its well, it shows in its children. Lack of wisdom is justified by the fact that everybody behind him who lacks wisdom just does the same thing. There's no thinking involved. Jesus is talking about the coming end, the, and he is the Messiah. And the information from the Old Testament is speaking about a man named John the Baptist. And they should have known who he was and why he was important. They shouldn't have jumped to conclusions to believe that Jesus was just the son of a carpenter and not the coming Messiah, because someone who is wise would have understood the signs of the times. And before we get into this, I want to give you some very a, a definition of wise in the Greek. That is the Koine Greek, which is the language written in the New Testament. The word for for uh, for wisdom is Sophia, written just like it's spelled as the girl's name, S O P H I A, Sophia. And it has a number of connotations to it as it's used 49 times in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. But here's generally what it says. <clears throat> it says that wisdom, broad and full of intelligence, used of the knowledge of very diverse matters. It's the wisdom which belongs to men, uh, which varied knowledge uh, belongs to men, specifically the varied knowledge of things human and divine acquired by acuteness and experience and summed up in maxims and proverbs. He continues down in ver five, skill in the management of affairs, devout and proper prudence in, in interactions with men who are not disciples of Christ, skill and discretion in, in imparting Christian truth to those kinds of people. Maybe that's what I'm doing for you now if you are not a believer in Christ. The knowledge and practice of the requisites of godly and upright living. And I want to contend to you that this is what Jesus is speaking of. 
It also moves into the supreme intelligence of God. There is, there is wisdom of men and there's wisdom of God, of God and of Christ. The wisdom of God has evinced the forming and executing of councils in the formation and government of the world and in its scriptures. The wisdom that God has in his midst is perfect and it has brought us uh, to this place. <clears throat> we need to trust it. And since the Bible is is legitimately uh, led and written by God through the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us that men led by the Holy Spirit wrote down what he wanted us to know, and his wisdom is written all throughout this book. Jesus is going to, to rail on those people who should have known better because wisdom was lacking and that he needed to get to them and say, this needs to be change. You need wisdom. We see in the Proverbs that Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. We need to know about God. It's the supreme wisdom. And how do we use that wisdom to, intel, to, to impart on people the knowledge of God, the understanding of God, the times that we're in, the things that are happening, the prophecies still yet to come, but the signs that are everywhere. And what should we do with that, with that wisdom? Well, Matthew chapter 11 starts with the fact that John the Baptist is in jail and he sends his two disciples out to ask the Messiah if Jesus is truly the Messiah they're looking for, the one that was prophesied in the Old Testament, or should they be looking for someone else? And we know that John the Baptist having been stuck in jail and having been the cousin of Jesus is a little bit discouraged because he's hoping that the Messiah, who hopefully was Jesus, would have come and got him out of there by now. That he would have been the war, the man, he would have been the man of war that they thought they were expecting to deliver them out of the hands of Rome. But Jesus hasn't done any of that. And so here's John the Baptist, who's just days away from his execution, really. And he's kind of like, okay, I don't know if maybe Jesus isn't what I thought I saw. I heard the voice of God tell me that Jesus was good. I saw the Holy Spirit come down like a dove when I baptized him in the Jordan. I know these things. I've witnessed these things. But yet I'm still sitting here in my suffering. And we've talked about that in other studies. <clears throat> so he tells these guys, Jesus says, you guys go back and tell them that everything you're watching me do is prophesied in the book of Isaiah and that I am the Messiah. And tell them not to be, tell them not to be offended because of what I have or have not done for him. He needs to understand that there is a higher calling. There's a higher wisdom, a godly wisdom in what is going on. He just needs to ride along because his time is done here. So after that, Jesus usually kind of eulogizes John the Baptist as being one of the best that, that has ever been. It says in chapter 11, verse 11, Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there is not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Putting things in perspective. Realize that John the Baptist is the best person ever to have been born outside of Jesus. But born of women, that means a man who is flesh and blood, born in normal ways. Not by the Holy Spirit as Jesus was to a virgin. But, but a, a true a person with a man and a woman coming together and copulating and having a kid. Right, He's the best that has ever been, yet he is the least. The least of the persons in heaven are, are better than even him. So you got to realize he's putting heaven in perspective. He continues in verse 12, he says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. There's going to be violence against the church, violence against his teachings, violence against God's wisdom, and those who understand need to move. Not stand still, not retract away, not go close their beliefs in some closet somewhere, but to speak the word of God and bring that wisdom and impart it on people. Remember what it said, devout and proper prudence in, in relationship with men who are not disciples of Christ, the skill and discretion to imparting Christian truth. Use wisdom, bring wisdom to everything you do and sprinkle it with salt in love 
and that therefore people would grow in wisdom. Remember, wisdom comes from above. The understanding comes from above. We are given gifts by Lord. James talks about that. Look at James chapter 1, verse, uh, verse 4. <clears throat> but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And if any of you lacks wisdom, it's the same word used 40 times, Sophia in the New Testament. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. You've got to have faith to believe that the wisdom coming to you and being imparted inside your heart is from the Lord and from the Lord alone. You need to know the word of God better than you know your back of your own hand. Wisdom is valuable. It's Take this. <clears throat> Knowledge is knowing what something is. Wisdom is understanding how to apply it in your life. Wisdom is far more important. And wisdom comes with years of experience knowledge of and practice of the requisites for godly and upright living but he says here specifically the varied knowledge of things human and divine acquired by acuteness observation experience and we can take that experience we can sum it up in parables and we can and maxims and stories and teachable moments that will allow us to pass it along to those who are behind us. Wisdom never changes because wisdom is of God. <clears throat> so all of these people, he's talking about the fact that John the Baptist, the guy that was prophesied in Malachi, has come and has made the way for the Messiah and that he's the one that John the Baptist made the way for. And you should understand this by wisdom. You should know this already. Verse 16. Well, it says in verse 14, And if you are willing to receive it, he's Elijah who is to come. By the, the Jewish people are still waiting for Elijah to come. Jesus just said that if you're willing to understand and receive what I'm saying, that John the Baptist was in the spirit of Elijah that is supposed to come to offer the coming of the Messiah. They didn't believe John the Baptist was the prophet of uh, uh, was Elijah. They didn't believe that Jesus was the Christ. And so they're still living this lie. They're still living believing that Elijah is going to show up someday. We can see that in their customs that can they continue to have their their uh, Passover meal, and they still leave a seat open for Elijah, believing that Elijah is going to come to make way and usher the way for the Messiah. But Jesus is saying, have wisdom and understand that that's happened. The Bible tells us this because the beginning of wisdom, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of God is the beginning of, is, is the beginning of wisdom. We need to know this. Jesus says, if you, if you receive it, Elijah has already come, and therefore that makes me the Messiah. And this is the most important wisdom that you can hold because it has eternal consequences if you don't believe who I am. Verse 15 says, He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. For those who have wisdom and understand this, for those who are led by the Spirit to understand this, hear what I'm saying and understand it. Verse 16, but he starts to talk about people without wisdom. He says, but to what I shall I liken this generation, a generation lacking wisdom of who I am and why it's important, of lacking the knowledge and practice of the requisites for godly and upright living, the wisdom of God as invinced in forming and executing councils in the formation and government of the worlds and in the scriptures. The understanding of God's truth is wisdom. He says, "Who do I? what do I liken this generation? Is it like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their companions and saying, we, we played a flute for you, but you didn't dance. We mourned to you and you didn't lament. We brought you good news and you didn't care. We brought you difficult news and you didn't cry. 
because you lack wisdom to see what you're seeing. You don't hear what you should be hearing. Had you read and understood and known the book, you'd know this. If you understand what is yet to come, and if you've read the prophecy still to come in this day and age, you would understand where we are sitting in the prophetic timeline. You would know that there was time was short, and you would be investing your life in a wise manner. And we'll get to that in a minute. Verse 18, for John came neither eating nor drinking, and they said he has a demon. John never committed a, a crime. He never drank. He never got... He was out in the wilderness. He had been given Nazarite status, and he had not drank any, any wine, nothing that came from the vine. That was one of the rules of being a Nazarite, much like Samson, who was a Nazarite. You're not allowed to drink anything that came from grapes. Can't eat grapes, can't drink wine, can't cut your hair. And John the Baptist didn't cut his hair. He didn't drink wine. He was eating locusts and honey. He wasn't dealing, he wasn't eating a, a non-kosher diet. He wasn't doing anything. He was the he was the guy that that the Bible tells us is the forerunner to the Christ. And he brought this repentance of sins and he was baptizing people in the Jordan. He was doing all the stuff that he was called to do. And yet you want to call him, you want to say he has a demon? <coughs> you want to say he's carrying a demon? You, you've misrepresented the Bible, the Old Testament, the prophets, it says in another place that, G, that everything that Jesus is doing must be fulfilled. The law, the prophets, and the Psalms all have to be fulfilled in Jesus. And they were perfectly. Everything that was prophesied about him was fulfilled. To include John the Baptist. Yet they didn't see him and they called him. They said that he has a demon because he's out there being weird. Failure to understand the scriptures. It says in verse 19, the son of man, that's Jesus, came eating and drinking. And they said, look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yeah, but why was Jesus hanging out with tax collectors and sinners? He tells us in another place that he came to save the lost, that sick people need a doctor, not those who are well. And he talked about the fact that unless you're more righteous than, than the, right, the most righteous people that are going on, supposedly, right, the religious leaders, everybody thought they were righteous. They weren't. They were worse than the humble of the humble. We learned that in the parable of the, of the Pharisee and the tax collector. But Jesus came to be around those who needed his help because he came to die for the sins of the world. All of this driven together, put John the Baptist together, repent of your sins, and Messiah who came to die for them, we run into Acts where it says, now, all of this sin that you've been dealing with up until this point, now you need to brush it under and repent of your sins because Jesus has come to die for you. And God proved that point by raising him from the dead, Acts chapter 16. Wisdom is understanding what's going on. Wisdom is understanding why he's here. Wisdom is most importantly taking what you've heard and what you have understood, the varied knowledge of things human and divine acquired by acuteness and experience and summed up in maxims and proverbs, things that can easily be packaged away and given over to, to, to deliver your wisdom on. But the Bible is replete in places where they didn't share the wisdom that they had learned in the wilderness and in Egypt. They hadn't shared that stuff and it got... And, and it got lost and the people came behind him, didn't understand the love of God or what they had done. And they had started to fall into idolatry and other problems. The Pharisees were no different. They didn't see the Messiah for who they should have known because they didn't have the wisdom that they needed. The eyes were not open and their ears were not attentive to what Jesus was saying. They thought that Jesus had come to be something he was, they, they, they even, they even, they even blame Jesus for having been casting demons out by the power of Satan. But why would Satan cast out demons in Satan's name? The demons belong to Satan. He'd be dividing his own power by it didn't make any sense. These guys didn't see who Jesus was because they lacked the wisdom. And that's where we come to that point when it says, but wisdom is justified by your children. 
That's to say that wisdom, wisdom and understanding of what biblical principles are come from those people who you can see have wisdom. And wisdom gets passed down from age to age and gets passed down from the from the Bible and the Bible and the Bible and the Bible. It gives us this information. We need to understand and live on it. And when somebody sees your life, they see that you live on the wisdom of God. And you have justified the wisdom by how you live. Well, then Jesus says something really interesting here. And this is something we need to take note of. Because up until this point, as we're living in the days that we're watching, we're very clear that time is now running out. And it's understandable that you need to know these things and have this understanding. And as I share it with you and you hear it, you're given understanding. Whether you do something with it or not is up to you. But realize that every time you hear it, there will be a greater and greater need for you to accept it. There will be a greater and greater opportunity to be judged in a more harsh way because you've been given the opportunity to repent, turn away from your sins, and live a life that is in wisdom and through Christ's blood, and you chose to deny it. And this is something we need to realize because we're living in a time when we're running out of time. And you need to understand the words that are coming out of my mouth sharing it to you in a way that you would understand what true wisdom of godliness and righteousness in these last days means. So Jesus says in verse 20, then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Now this is a scary statement right away. He says he's rebuking or he's he's speaking against, he's speaking judgment against cities who saw him do all the things that John the Baptist is seeing him do. The disciples, his two disciples are seeing him do. All these people are following him around, watching him heal and cast out demons. The, the blind see, the deaf hear, the, the those who are dumb are speaking. Those people who are, who are broken are getting up and leaping away and running away like a deer. All of these things. And then the gospel is being shared and repentance is being reached. And yet these cities who are watching it the most didn't agree and didn't believe. They were locked in that idea that Jesus was just that son of a carpenter and he just came from, he's not God, he, he, he was born of Mary and he, why do we, why should we listen to this guy, even though he's doing amazing things? Wisdom is justified by its children. And in this case, these cities have lack of wisdom. And their lack of wisdom is being shown in their children by how they believe, what they believe, what they do, and what they fail to do, which is repent of their sins. Understand why Jesus is there. Understand who John the Baptist is. Understand the crux of the gospel is to believe in Jesus because your sins need to be wiped out. They didn't believe that. They didn't believe that. It says here that then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done. That should have been evidence he's the Messiah. Yeah, but they lacked wisdom and they did not repent. Verse 21 in Jesus' words says, Woe to you, Chorazon. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Tyre and Sidon were up in, are up in Le- current-day Lebanon. They, were, they weren't even Jewish nations. They were secular nations. But if Jesus showed up in those cities to do the things he was doing, they would have repented of their sins if Jesus was doing that kind of work. At this point, he wasn't. He was only working in the Jewish nation because he wanted the Jews to understand who he was first so that they could take the wisdom put together in maxims and proverbs, taking the wisdom of God, the wisdom of what Jesus said, the wisdom of the gospel, and spreading it out to all the whole world. But they didn't do that. They didn't want to do that. They shared, they they, they hide it away. They don't even understand it here. Bethsaida and Chorazon were, were, were cities that were north up in the Galilee region where he was doing most of his miracles, and yet they didn't see it because they couldn't get past the fact that he was, he was born of Mary and Joseph. He was just a carpenter's son. 
lack of wisdom. What, did, what was the varied knowledge of things human and divine acquired by acuteness and experience? Should have known. Should have known. The wisdom is justified by its children. And they have lack of wisdom. And it fails. The kids aren't justified in anything. And Jesus is rebuking them in hard ways. He says, even this, these two Gentile wicked pagan nations, had they heard what I was telling them, they would, have, they would have come to their knees and they would have repented of themselves. Remember, Nineveh, Jonah shows up and bam, they all get saved because Jonah came in and talked about destruction in Nineveh. We also see what happens a hundred years later when we read the book of Nahum, when there isn't anybody speaking the, speaking the words of repentance and Assyria is destroyed. They're judged, never to be seen again. You gotta understand the ramifications of the wisdom of knowing who Jesus is. So he talks about Tyre and Sidon. They would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. This is important. Because with much knowledge comes much responsibility. And Jesus is saying, you should have known. Therefore, your judgment will be harsher than theirs. And that tells us that judgment is hard, has levels in, in hell. It will have levels of experience based on what you knew. And every time you hear the gospel and you choose to turn your back on it, there's more and more opportunity for you to be saved that you fail to take. And at some point, it will be over. And then he will take, God in judgment, will take all of the times and all the opportunities that you had to understand him. You would have had the knowledge and had the understanding, and yet you would have not taken it. Instead, you would lack wisdom and lack that. Daniel in chapter 12 says, the wise will understand, but the wicked will continue doing wickedly, and they won't understand. And he's talking about the days we live in now, a prophetic time to come. See, I implore you that understanding and listening to what I'm saying, don't, don't close your heart to the gospel. Don't close your heart to the words of God. It says here that it's going to be easier for Tyre and Sidon who never heard the truth in their judgment than it will be for you who should have understood and saw exactly what had happened. You should have known. And yet you turned away willingly. Verse 23. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom... It would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Capernaum really messed up, apparently. Jesus is saying Sodom is, it's, it's going to be less problematic for Sodom than it will be for you in the judgment. You should have known. Remember in Genesis where God shows up, the angel the angel of Christ, it's Christ, but the angel of the Lord shows up, tells Abraham, I'm going to send my angels down there to see if all of this wickedness I'm hearing about Sodom and Gomorrah is true. And then when they go in there and they find out it is absolutely true, he wipes it off the map. There wasn't any chance to repent there. Lot is the only one who got the opportunity, Lot and his wife and his daughters, because nobody else listened to the warning. But Bethsaida, but, 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 Capernaum, which Jesus was in Capernaum most of his life doing amazing things. They should have had the under, they had the inside track, the insider trading. They had everything they needed, and yet they denied Jesus. They tried to throw him over a hill and kill him for blasphemy instead of understanding who, who was standing in their midst. <sighs> Sodom had all kinds of problems and we're living in a nation now that is far worse than Sodom. And if Jesus says, in the last days, it'll be like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah when I come back and judge it, then 
we're standing on the precipice of that issue. But that's for another, that's for another teaching. You should know. But you could know things. You could have knowledge, biblical knowledge. I have a friend who, who reads the Bible and understands what it says, but I don't know if he quite understands what he's hearing. I don't think he's ever dug down deep to believe what it is it says. And that worries me because you can say all you want about the Bible. It's just a book of old stories. But you got to realize that we're, look, we're living in a time now that is so far more amazing than any time ever in the history of man. More prophetic stuff is happening now than has ever happened in, in history. And it's supposed to be a conglomeration, a convergence of all kinds of prophetic things happening at once. Jesus told us, keep your eyes open for this time period in, in life. And we're in it. And it is in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot, I will be coming. Wisdom. The understanding of what you read and how you understand it and what the Spirit leads us to believe so that you can make good decisions in the final days. Pass it along to those who don't know him. Share Jesus with everybody you know. Share him being crucified, why he's crucified, why it's important. Jesus, in just a couple of pages in chapter 13, verse 44 and then verse 40. Five shares us two parables, really simple. They say the same thing. 44 says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and he, and for the, for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has. And he buys that field. He's walking through a field and he finds the greatest treasure ever to have been located. He buries it back in the field. He goes home, he sells everything that he owns, and then he buys the field to have the treasure legally. This is the kingdom of heaven. Sell everything you have. Nothing in this world is worth what's coming. It used to be like this when I was a kid. I had an allowance. And the things that I wanted to buy were more than my allowance. So I had a choice. I could go blow my money on baseball cards when I got it, or I could save it and buy things that were better. That takes patience and investment. That's what it's saying here. Invest in heaven. Don't worry about the things of earth. And if you were what, if you were worried about not having, you know, the rapture and all of this stuff was coming in eighty years, it's not. It's on the doorstep. And furthermore, Jesus says in the, in the letter of Laodicea, he's sitting at your door and he's lock, knocking and you just let him in and he'll come in and dine with you. Invest in heaven now. Give your time and effort to the Bible and to understanding and to get wisdom. Ask God for wisdom. James told us that. But don't doubt that what you're asking for is coming from the God of heaven who gives all good things liberally to us. The second parable, verse 45 says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. There's only one treasure out there. Everything else is going to burn up. You can't take it with you. The only two things that are of any value in any way and any where is is the the souls of men and the word of God. It's the only two things that are eternal. So you're going to work your life working for temporal stuff here. Instead of knowing that we're standing on the doorstep of the end of time here, as we know it. And you could be investing everything that you have in heaven, where you'll be given that opportunity to buy better stuff. You'll have it for eternity. You can't lose it. Wisdom. Wisdom. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The first thing, the only thing. And God will take care of all this other stuff. 
And I can speak directly about this because I live a life that cared so much about these things until now. When all this stuff that I, to what cost? To what cost? I have been walking with the Lord now about eight or nine years and my wisdom continues to grow in what is most important. And I'm finding myself more and more giving everything that I have to the Lord. I understand who I serve. I don't serve myself and my own selfish personal interests. Why? Because at any moment, the rapture could happen and I, I don't get to take that with me. Priorities are a, a point of all of this. What, what, where is the wisdom that you're walking in? Look, if you're looking for the pearl of wisdom, if you're looking for something that's really, really important and you find it, sell everything else and buy the one that's most important. Pearls of wisdom or a field with a tremendous treasure in it. Knowing that having sold everything that you own to buy the pearl or the field with the treasure in it, you gain so much more. Investing in, your, investing in yourself, investing in heaven, investing in the kingdom, investing in those who don't know Jesus, investing in eternity. This is the important part of all of this. Because as we walk, as we walk by faith and not by sight, God continues through our own witness, through the things that happen to us, through... Years, Pastor Ed said last night that by the time Abraham sent Eleazar, his, his servant, out to find a wife for Isaac, he was 140 years old. By that time, how much faith do you have in God by that time when God has always blessed you all the way? You make your silly mistakes in the beginning, but by the end, you should have enough wisdom not to make the silly mistakes to understand who you serve, that you don't serve yourself, that you, that you died to yourself and you gave over your life and the deed to your life to the Lord. And that everything you say and do should be a, a transference of what he's asked you to do. I promise you, it may not feel comfortable because you want to do one thing and he wants you to do another, but if you walk in his way, I promise you it will be far better for you. Because everything that he does in your life, he has a perfect plan and a will for. And by the end of all of that, wisdom will gush out of you and an understanding why things happen the way they thought. I don't know why my ears stopped working. I can't hear out of my left ear. But God apparently let it happen. Nothing crosses his desk without him giving the say-so before it comes down to me. And as long as between me and him, one of us knows what's going on, and uh, spoiler alert, it's him, at least one of us knows what's happening and that there's a reason for it. And I gotta be, I gotta, I gotta trust him that that is an, I gotta trust him in that. How wonderful a gift when the rapture does happen or I pass away and die and I stand before the Lord because my last breath here will be my first breath before him and I will hear the music that is being sung by the angels that the Bible talks about in heaven. I will hear that with two perfect ears and surround sound. And the longer I have to deal with this problem here, the more glorious that gift will be. So it's not all bad, even though it's a, it's uncomfortable and it's obnoxious. I wish, I, I wish he would take it away and maybe he will one day. All he has to do, Jesus can put fingers in ears and make them hear. He, he did it in the gospels, but God doesn't do everything. He didn't heal everybody. And remember what he told John the Baptist, blessed is he who is not offended because of me. If I do something differently than you are believing, don't be offended. Don't be tripped up. Don't stumble. Don't fall away from the faith because your, your, your faith in me was so, was so riddled with the idea that it needed to go a certain way or you wouldn't believe. Believe me. I've got something better. 
But this takes wisdom and time and it takes time and testing and it takes difficulties and hardships to see back in the past, to see how he delivers you through the hardest things of your life, to understand that God is in the midst of all of these things and these things are true. This is how we build wisdom. Wisdom comes from knowing God. Wisdom comes from pursuing God with everything you have. And investing in heaven instead of the silly things that are here on earth. We get caught up in the me generation and then what, 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 what part of that has any value in it at all? None. You fool. Your soul will be demanded of you today. And you went and built bigger barns so that you could, you could take care of your wealth. You know. Now who's going to get your bigger barns? You failed to understand that investing in the kingdom while you're still on earth has far reaching implications for the values that you will have, the treasures that you will have, the amount of work you have in heaven for eternity when he can't lose it and he can't take it and he can't die and he can't give it over to somebody else and he doesn't need to be inherited, it's yours. Let me give you some let me give you some wisdom. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. God will take care of everything else. Realize that what you seek here is a microcosm of what's coming. So when you invest, invest for the future. You'll get way more out of it. Your return on investment will be insane. But you have to look past the now. And you have to look past yourself. And you have to look past these fleshly things that you want, the toys that you want, the, the job that you want, all of this stuff that so soon will pass. And seek after the things that will last in heaven. This is wisdom. Jesus would say that him who have an ear, let him hear. Be blessed.